So he's saying that uh, he's been using Scan Unlimited, but he's finding the items that he wants are usually out of stock. So in that aspect, um, you know, that's gonna happen from time to time. You just need to keep getting updated uh, um, product catalogs from EE, but not just product catalogs from EE. I literally redid the entire wholesale module. So not only if you go to the list in the very beginning, I added a number of other sites there. It used to be like, I don't know, like we'll say like 50 to 70. It's probably now like 70 to 100. So there's other sites that I've added that you can apply to and then obviously get product catalogs from them. So you don't just wanna limit yourself to EE. You wanna do it with a bunch of them, right? Because all of those are vetted suppliers that you can order from. Get a product catalog from them, from them. If they do that, a lot of them will. Some of them won't like BBCW um, and some others, but the majority of them, probably 95% if not more, will give you a product catalog that's itemized with like UPCs or ASINs. So put, you know, apply to more places, apply those uh, or get those product catalogs and then put more product catalogs in the software and go about it that way. Don't just limit yourself to EE, okay? For wholesale, which category should a new seller uh, focus on since the new seller is gated in most categories? So there's a couple different ways to approach that. I wanna answer that question in a couple different ways. So first and foremost, which category? Me personally, I don't think that there's really a category that you should focus on more so than others, right? Obviously, you don't wanna go into you know gated categories like automotive, for example. That said, for wholesale, obviously, if you're sourcing 10 plus quantity and you're sourcing from a legitimate supplier like you know the list in the course um, or you know even a legitimate supplier that's been vetted on like a wholesale directory or something like that, then in that aspect, you're gonna be able to use that invoice to get ungated for that product assuming it's a legitimate supplier and you order 10 plus quantity of that actual product, right? So it really doesn't matter necessarily which category you go after wholesale wise. Um, now for other things, I would recommend, you know, just picking and choosing category to category, product to product, each product's gonna be different. And yes, you're right, you're definitely gonna be gated for a certain amount of things in the beginning. Um, a great way to get, you know, through that is sell a lot of stuff so you can get auto and gated. And a great way to do that is selling a lot of very, very cheap books. So if you haven't checked out the book, um, you know, module yet, I'd recommend checking that out. You can source books through eFlip or through Zen Arbitrage, um, but more so I would recommend to get ungated is get a bunch of free books or get a bunch of cheap books. And there's a million ways that I show you how to do that. Not a million, but there's probably like a dozen ways I show you how to do that in that actual module. And then just start selling that as like a side hobby. You might not make much money, if any, right? but you're gonna start ranking your Amazon account to get auto ungated in other things because you're gonna have a lot more sales. It's gonna increase your metrics. Oh, and by the way, it will help you get the buy box in the future at lower prices when you compete against other sellers because you have better seller metrics, you'll get more feedback, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So that's, <coughs> excuse me, that's what I'd recommend for that. I'd recommend A, don't worry about it when you're really sourcing wholesale because you'll be able to get ungated, assuming it's not like an, a gated category like an automotive, for example. Um, on top of that, also focus on you know selling a lot of products and the one of the easiest ways that you can get cheap products is books because like I said, you can get them free a lot of times and I've showed countless examples in that actual book flipping module to get free books. And on top of that, you can get them very, very cheap even if you decide to pay for them, okay? So Richard says, sellers might send to Amazon a shipment that can cost $5,000, for example. Do sellers need to insure the shipment to protect his or her investment if so, uh, what is a good reputable insurance company for this purpose? If you have your receipt, would Amazon reimburse you your, your full investment? What steps to take if Amazon misplaces part of the shipment? Thanks again, the Q&A is helping me a lot. So great question, Richard. Um, it really depends twofold, right? If you're, honestly, if you're ordering a shipment or you're doing a shipment into Amazon that's you know $5,000, it's probably most likely a wholesale shipment, which is what I'm guessing. And then in that aspect, you're probably ordering from a wholesale company who's doing all the packaging or, or all the packing of the items, all the labeling of the items, the, the lot manifest and all that good stuff as well, um, and then shipping into FBA for you, right? So in that aspect, you're very rarely going to, because they, they packaged it you know, up to FBA standards and they're used to doing that, because they have a lot manifest and because everything in there has an itemized invoice with it, that they're sending and matches the weight exactly, you're rarely gonna run into that, that issue, at least in my experience, with a wholesale company when you're ordering in bulk, okay? Usually, in my experience, when people run into an issue where Amazon receives less items than they send in, supposedly, it's when you're doing the shipping into FBA yourself, right? It's when you're throwing a bunch of different various items into a box, and then you know you might have three of one SKU 
five of another SKU, 10 of another SKU, or maybe you even have like multiple boxes in your Amazon shipment and you ship them all in and their various items in different, you know, SKUs and different amounts of those SKUs, right? So in that situation, what I would recommend that you do is A, you want to label everything, okay? Label everything. I don't care if it doesn't prompt you to label it, say that you're going to relabel it yourself and put the Amazon barcode on it, then print out all the barcodes in the, when you're shipping into FBA and you're going through that process, that will pretty much ensure that they scan everything in properly. A lot of times is when, not only are you shipping things, when people run into this issue, is when you're shipping items yourself into FBA and then you label some and you have Amazon label the other ones or you label some and then you have, you know, you leave the other ones as like the merchant barcode because you're not prompted to label them, right? So I would say first and foremost, label everything, okay? Secondly, take pictures of everything Take uh, and just keep them in like a folder on your iPhone. Now, I don't do this because I haven't ran into this issue a lot recently, especially as I've been moving more into wholesale and a lot of my items are coming from wholesale companies or even ordering liquidation uh, into Amazon sometimes. So I rarely see this issue. I used to see it a lot more when I did coupon products, when I'd send like 50 to like 100 items in, in like a couple boxes and they were all different SKUs and different you know amounts of those SKUs. So in that aspect, you yeah, you're gonna see a little bit of discrepancy. So if you're doing that, which I don't think that you are, it sounds more like you're moving into like something like wholesale because you're saying five grand so you know you're probably doing something more scalable like that um, I would say take pictures of everything right so make sure that you label it with all the Amazon barcodes take pictures of everything in that box and take pictures of the box on the scale weighing the amount that it does right and then if you're shipping it in right you shouldn't really uh, face that issue now if you do face that issue and maybe you send in like 60 items and they've said that they received like 57 of them, right? And they're missing three, then there is a way that you can do that. I will, I forget, I think there's a, there's either, I'm pretty sure there's one in the course. Let me make sure. Um, I think there's, I know I've done multiple ones of this because obviously it updates frequently like how you actually go about in the back end of Seller Central for claiming those items. It's the same process overall, it just switches a little bit differently when they update Seller Central. I made like three versions of that video, but let me check to make sure that that video is actually in the course and then I'll point you in the direction that it is. So let me find it really fast. But that's what I'd obviously recommend that you do, right? I would just recommend that you uh, you claim if for whatever reason they miss some of your shipments, then claim those sh those uh, those items in that shipment that you ship ship them in, send the pictures for proof, and bam, they should reimburse you. Now they might not reimburse you for what you you thought that you could sell it for, but they will reimburse you for the retail value or whatever the buy box price or whatever they deem that you could sell it for, right? So you won't lose money on those. Uh, let me find it really fast. It's probably in the Amazon tips module. And there is how Amazon shares the buy box. It doesn't look like I have it in here. So it doesn't look like I have it in here. So what I'm gonna do when I actually post this in the course q and I'll drop that video in a comment directly below this for you. I know I've done a video on it on YouTube. I've done several of them. I'll find one. I'll link that video directly in the comments below for you. Check that out. But like I said, the easiest way is either order it from a wholesale company who's gonna have an itemized list of everything that they send in anyway. And you're rarely gonna find that an issue with that. And if you do, obviously, then you could take it up with a wholesale company specifically. And the wholesale companies can send all their proof and data to Amazon. You won't really have an issue there, right? The second thing, like I said, to recap is if you are shipping in yourself, make sure you label it, make sure you take pictures of everything, make, label everything, right? Take pictures of everything, make sure that you also take pictures of the box weight. And you shouldn't really face many issues with that as well if you're labeling everything. Although if you do check the video directly below, that will allow you to claim in the back end of your Seller Central all your missing uh, items and then Amazon will reimburse you for them. They usually reimburse you 90 to 95% of the time, especially if it's not something that you're doing a lot, right? If you're missing, if you're sending in shipments and they're always missing an item here or there, then probably it's the way that you're sending the shipments in or something that you're doing. Um, but if you send you know, a bunch of shipments in and they only miss an item here or there every once in a while, then you can claim in the back end of Seller Central and they're gonna see your history of it and they're not really gonna think twice about reimbursing you, you know, for those missing items if it's not like a pattern okay so good question so Jacob now says I am just now about to start selling on Amazon I've checked to see if I'm able to sell some of the items that I found and gotten this message due to a limited account available of oh, due to limited account activity your ability to create listings wait due to limited account activity your ability to create listings has been disabled to restore 
your ability to create listings, please click on replace charge method to either add a new card or select an existing credit card processing. So I actually never read this one before. It looks like I didn't even like it, so I might not have seen it. Um, but in short, it honestly sounds like you just need to, to change your credit card. So the reason that they're asking you to do that is because in most cases when you have a credit card or you have an account balance, um, they're gonna take it off your account balance, but because you don't have an updated credit card and there, you don't have, like, lim you, haven't, you haven't sold a bunch of things, so there's an account balance there for them to deduct, they just wanna make sure that you can actually pay for the shipment, it sounds like. So in that case, I would say just change your credit card or update your bank to you know, your, your relevant recent bank, and then you should be pretty good because they just wanna make sure that there's a card on file there that they can charge and authorize to charge if for whatever reason you don't sell those items so that they can charge you for the shipping, right? So I would say just update your card or update it to a new bank account um, and then retry that. That sounds like it would work, Jacobs. Do I pre-order items from EE? If so, what's my philosophy on finding pre-order items? So I don't pre-order anything from EE or pre-order um, anything or like back order anything from EE or any of the wholesale companies, what I actually do is I look for things that are in inventory, okay? I know people that do that and kind of wanna be first to market so they'll pre-order something as soon as it goes live or it's like hot off the truck, right? I don't personally do that. I find success avoiding that in future. So, because I don't like to, you know, judge a product ahead of time and then buy into it, you know, especially with wholesale when you're buying a lot of products in bulk for that one listing because I'm judging the listing at that current time. I have no idea, I can assume, but I have no idea what's gonna happen to that product listing you know, a couple weeks from now, or even a month or two when that item fully comes in stock. So no, I don't buy anything pre-order from EE or any of the wholesale companies, and I don't really recommend that you do, although I know other people that do it and have success with it, but I just, I'm not into kind of guessing or assuming. I wanna be sure, right? I'm putting my money into this business. I wanna make sure that the money comes back with an ROI. So that's kind of my approach, okay? Wholesale arbitrage for people outside the US. How can I find suppliers who don't ask for a reseller's permit? In Mexico, that document doesn't exist. Thanks, Brian. So in that aspect, two things with that, Hernan. Um, I would say number one, uh, you, you need a wholesale uh, permit or a reseller's license, or there's a million different names for it, regard, like depending on the state that you're trying to get it in, or there might even be you know, that document in Mexico just under a different name, right? So maybe call up you know, your, your local government or whatever it is and ask if that's something that you can get. Um, you know, I'm sure there's some kind of document that basically shows that you're either a sole proprietor or um, I think they call it a sole trader in the, in the UK. So there's probably some kind of document that maybe you're not aware of, but if not, you know, I don't live in Mexico, so maybe if not, then what I'd recommend is secondly, if you can't find that or you've searched or you've called you know, your go government and they, there's no way to kind of get around that, then what I'd recommend is just form an LLC in the US in you know, a state that has tax benefits. I'm not gonna recommend a specific state. You can just Google that and figure out which one it is. There's a bunch of them. I think like Texas comes to mind. I think Florida comes to mind. Um, I think, uh, just Google them. I think Delaware comes to mind. Maybe, I, I, there, like I said, there's like seven to 10 of them, I think. So just Google that, form an LLC. Maybe Rhode Island's another one. Form an LLC in one of those states in the US. It's only gonna cost you, if you do it through like LegalZoom, it's really only gonna cost you like 150 bucks to like 300 bucks, depending on the state. But just go with one that's like a cheaper state, like 150, and then you're 150 bucks into your LLC. You formed an LLC to protect yourself, which is what I always recommend eventually anyway for resellers. So you knock that out of the park and it's relatively cheap at 150 bucks. Plus, if you're scaling up wholesale to any certain degree, you're, you're probably you know, gonna start a legitimate business anyway and be selling a lot and making a lot of money with that. So you probably want an LLC in the future anyway, right? So form an LLC in one of those states and then with that LLC, you can get a reseller's permit. Um, I believe there, this, there's a section at the, toward the end of the course that shows you how to get a reseller's permit. Um, you know, if you need me to point you in that direction, just comment on this and I'll point you in that direction. But that's what I'd recommend. If you can't find it in, in Mexico, which you probably can, but I could be wrong. Like I said, I, you would know better than me. Then go with an LLC, form an LLC, and use that LLC to get a reseller's permit in the US, okay? If that doesn't work or you don't wanna do that, then just pick a different business model. There's a bunch of other business models that you can do from Mexico, right? 
So you can also probably get you know coupon sites or cashback sites or even liquidation and order it to you and then resell back on Amazon Mexico or you know other reselling you know marketplaces that you like like maybe eBay Mexico or something like that if that exists I think it does um, back in yours or you can just use a prep center for the US one of the best ways and I have a couple students in Mexico that I know of firsthand that do reselling books back on Amazon US with a prep center and it's super easy because while they're charged a slight fee per product it's only like 50 cents to a dollar per, per uh, fee per per book and then your margins are a lot right so that you can afford to take that like dollar or 50 cents off the book margin because your margins are going to be like 20 bucks to like 100 bucks sometimes on a book and then just ship it into FBA and let FBA store FBA US store all your book inventory and then you're just gonna make good money on those books and it doesn't really cost you a lot, right? So those are the best options for you. Like I said, check Mexico. If not, then get an LLC and get a reseller's permit in the US, do it that way. Or if not, just pick a different business model that doesn't require you to get a reseller's permit, although liquidation obviously would as well. So I hope that that helps and answers your question. How do you handle when Amazon splits your shipment? Example. I was sending uh, 26 books in, Amazon split the shipment to 25 in a box and one in the other box, increasing the cost of shipping. So there's two ways to basically do this. You can elect to, I forget what it's actually called because I actually don't ever use it, but if they actually split it up, you can elect to put it on the same box and they will charge you for that, okay? So you really need to, to A, figure out what, I forget what that's called actually because like I said, I never actually use it. It's basically just you elect to send them all to the same FBA warehouse and they charge you a fee for you know electing to do that. You can do that in the back end of your seller central when you're actually initiating an FBA shipment, although I, like I said, never do that. So that you have to kind of weigh out whether the increase in shipping the one, obviously it's annoying to be like, hey, there's 25 going to one prep center and one item going to the other. So like, what's the point? Why can't I just put the one in the 20, you know, five box and make it 26? You have to weigh the options on like, okay, I'm charged like, $5 for the 25 box and like $7 for the one box because maybe it's going further across the country, right? And add them up and then factor in, okay, but if I pay for, and it, it's gonna depend obviously on how many you're shipping in to different places or how many are actually in your shipment, you know, which if you're shipping to like five different places, it's probably gonna be more expensive, you know, to ship to five different places rather than electing to ship them all to one and just paying the fee, right? Although if you're just shipping to two, often it can be cheaper to just ship the to two warehouses instead of choosing to ship it all to one, right? So you really need to weigh each of those options and decide which is cheaper for you depending on your shipments and depending on which FBA warehouses and where you're selling, you're sending them to, okay? Now, because I don't ever actually elect to do that, um, what I basically do is that happens to me all the time. And if you still actually, and you said you're sending in books, so your margins are probably relatively high with those books. If you still factor it in, let's say that hypothetically, you said 25 in a box and one in another. So that's 26 books in total. Maybe you got charged, let's go higher. Let's say you got charged $8 to ship, you know, the 25 books in to one place and you got charged even $10, right? Even $10 to ship that one book to California if you live on the East Coast or maybe to the East Coast if you live on the West Coast or whatever it is, right? That's still only 18 bucks that you're paying to ship 26 books in. So if I pull up a calculator really fast, it's still very, 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 very cheap per product. So your margins aren't really getting cut into really at all, okay? It's annoying, I'll give you that. I def it definitely annoys me too, but it's really still cheap. So it's gonna cost you a little bit under 70 cents per book to ship those in, and that's very, very cheap still. So um, that's why I always recommend like when you're estimating your profit margins, either go 50 cents to a buck because that's gen, and if you wanna be more conservative, always go a buck because that's pretty much gonna cover any costs like that. And you know, any, and if you, for whatever reason, go a little bit higher where you're, you're, it breaks your shipments in, then obviously you're kind of, you've already estimated that, right? But a dollar, you know, it depends on what books you're shipping in obviously, but a dollar or 70 cents per book your margins are still gonna be very, very high. So that's my short answer. Another better answer for you, if you don't wanna obviously elect to send them all to the same prep center for a fee, or you don't wanna approach it like I just said, is wait to send more books in, right? So if you have 26, wait till 50, right? Or wait till 100 and just you know get a bunch of inventory and save it up for like two weeks and then send it all in together as like 100 units or like 50 units so that, hey, if they break it up to multiple uh, prep centers, then it might be like 20 per one prep center and then like a 10 for the other and then like five for the other. And then it's a little bit more justifiable to ship you know 10 units to one prep center instead of just one, okay? 
So I hope that helps for Carter, but that was a great question. Um, I get it, it's annoying, but your margins on, for my guess would still be relatively high. Uh, so I wouldn't really worry about it if that's the case. Any tips on how to manage sales tax via Seller Central platform? I know Amazon withholds it for certain states. Are there any specific sales tax settings we need to be aware of? I just realized that I need to, needed to include sales tax on items I sell here in Florida. I know each state is different. Yeah, so this is a question I get asked a lot and be perfectly transparent with you. It depends state to state, right? So for me in PA, I'm pretty sure that they just collect all the sales tax, uh, sales tax for me. Um, and then for, for each state that I'm like selling items in. Um, but for you specifically, it might depend on your state specifically. You said you're in Florida. I'm not exactly sure how Amazon collects sales tax for Florida. So you're gonna have to do a little bit of research and you know um, figure out how that applies to you. But a quick Google search on that, you know, should yield you answers. And in my, it's my understanding that for you, and keep in mind, do a Google search, verify this, right? But it's my understanding that they'll probably collect in your situation, even if they don't collect it on all of them, they'll collect it on a number of them. And then you just have to go into the back end of Seller Central and make sure that you're collecting sales tax for those other states. Um, again, a quick Google search or a quick YouTube video should yield you that result. I'm sorry, I wish I had a better answer for you, but that's just full transparency. For me, I don't really collect it because Amazon collects it for me, okay? Richard says, uh, beginner question, is it possible to send a shipment of many different items into Amazon? I mean, a shipment, for example, of 10 groceries Grocery item or 12 grocery items, 10 video games, 12 books, 12 CDs. Did they go in the same box or separate boxes? Thanks in advance. So it really depends. They can, in short, you can send them all in the same box, right? You can send them all, it doesn't really matter. Now, the longer answer would be you really need to, because you said something about grocery items, you said something about um, books and CDs and video games. So it really depends on the breakability of those and how well you're prepping your boxes as well. So that's definitely something that you want to keep in mind. So for example, if you're shipping in like breakable grocery products, you might not want to ship them in with a bunch of heavy books. So those are things that you're going to have to consider. Um, you can elect to ship them in and initiate shipments, you know, separately if you want. But in short, if you're not worried about the breakability of items or, you know, them going bad or not being refrigerated or anything like that, then yes, you can ship them all in. Um, just make sure that you prep your box as well. Use, you know, uh, bubble wrap and all that good stuff so that your, your boxes are kind of tight and they're, they're protected. And then you can ship them all in together. It doesn't really matter. Okay. So tips on getting approved once you actually do, you know, reach out to a supplier or you do find somebody how you how you're going to go about getting approved if they actually want to talk to you okay whether you pick up the phone and actually talk to them or you talk through them through email when you communicate with them and uh, potential suppliers you want to be professional and you want to let them know mainly what the most important thing to them is that you can actually sell their items quickly okay because they're not looking for another you know small business or a small uh, amazon seller or a small e-commerce seller to sell a couple products here and there and you don't necessarily have to tell them that that might be all that you can sell initially, uh, but they are specifically looking for another high quality distribution chain that's gonna sell their items quickly, okay? So that's kind of how you wanna position yourself, whether you're talking to them on their phone or you're emailing them, you wanna come off professional and you wanna let them know that you can flip their items quickly on Amazon and sell them fast so that both of you can profit and benefits both of you and also give them another opportunity as a high quality distribution chain for their business, okay? You also want, the, want them to see you as like a strong potential partner, right? So you don't want to come off as somebody that's like just selling out of their parents' basement or just selling out of their garage, right? Just like a part-time seller. You do not want to come off that way to a high and reputable company because top brands and top suppliers want to form partnerships with reputable companies and reputable sellers that can move their products quickly, okay? So those are some tips on getting approved if you need them. Remember, this is basically the formula for finding suppliers right here. It's the six step formula. Then I literally just rinse and repeat. It's really that simple. So Alex says, thanks for this video. I wanted to ask the same question about pre-ordering items from EE, but it's already been answered in this video. I have a follow-up question regarding ordering items from wholesale distributors. What about finding profitable items that are temporarily out of stock? Should I consider ordering those items? So. That's a good question. Um, I know people that do that, right? Like I know people that try to order items that are out of stock and kind of time the market because with wholesale, they say that not always, um, and I don't do this myself, but wholesale people usually say you want to either be first to market or last to market. You want to avoid like the middle wave where there's like a lot of um, you know competition on the listing, right? So some people do target like sold out and then try to time the market and be last to market with a good profit margin. I don't do that and I don't necessarily recommend that you do that either, right? It's a good question though. So what I basically do is, the reason you don't wanna do that, right, is because 
you don't know when it's gonna be in stock, right? You don't know when it's gonna be back in stock. And for that reason, I don't wanna you know, play guessing games and order ahead of time when a lot of things could change on that product listing, right? Somebody might tank the price and then you're not profitable anymore and you still have to ship those products in to sell them off and like, you know, get whatever profit you can even though you're losing money, right? So, the, or a lot more people could come on and they might not sell as quickly and your cash flow might be tied up. Or there's like so many different, you know, factors that could change on the product listing and you're not 100% sure when it's gonna be in stock. Even with EE or any of the wholesale companies, even if, and they don't always do this, but even if they tell you it's expected to be in stock at this date and you kind of gauge it that way, that changes, right? Every once in a while that will change, right? So let's say they expect it to be in stock in a month or a couple weeks, that could change and be a couple weeks or a month after that. There's no guarantee that it's gonna be in stock at that point. So I would just avoid doing that what I do personally and what works best for me is just sourcing for things that are in stock and looking at the product listing currently, right? Because then you know it's currently doing that and you can literally order it into FBA or order it to your location and ship it into FBA and you know that you, you're you literally locking that down right now as quickly as possible so there's less potential for things to change on that product listing.